Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner. Today's topic, circuit material test results at 110 gigahertz. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod. I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm gonna to talk about testing at 110 gigahertz and looking at circuit performance up to that frequency. Now for test methods, there's a lot of test methods out there to characterize uh, materials, high frequency materials. There's test methods that are more appropriate for RF microwave frequencies and then other test methods at millimeter wave frequencies. In general, there's less test methods as the higher you go in frequency. So millimeter wave, there's less test methods uh, that are appropriate. And then if you look at wide band type of test methods, there are even less of those. So it's difficult to find a good test method that is a wide band test method uh, up to the millimeter wave frequencies, in this case up to 110 gigahertz. In the table shown here, there are different test methods and the two groups are really raw material type of testing and then circuit type of testing to characterize the material performance for dielectric constant. And you can see for the raw material testing, we're looking at waveguides, waveguide resonators, sometimes waveguide cavities, and also free space measurements. And uh, these test methods all have, again, capabilities and limits that are good for certain things and maybe not so good for others. One drawback for these type of test methods are that they test the x-axis or the y-axis or the x-y plane of the material and typically the designers are interested in looking at the z-axis dielectric properties of the material. The table on the right is testing using circuits for material characterization and in this case you can determine the z-axis dielectric constant and other properties of the material by using circuit uh, testing. Now one of the circuits that is tested very often or used for testing is a ring resonator. Ring resonators are very often used for characterizing materials uh, typically at microwave range frequencies and sometimes at millimeter wave range frequencies. However, one drawback at the higher frequencies is that the uh, ring resonator needs to be on a thin material or a thin circuit and the thinner the circuit, the more difficult it is to get a clean resonant response. And then sometimes you have issues with the, cap, the uh, gap coupling to the resonator as well uh, for a thin type of circuit. Another issue at these very high frequencies is radiation. Ring resonators, when they're designed properly, should have no radiation loss. However, in reality, there are circuit fabrication uh, influences that can cause some amount of radiation at very high frequency. So when radiation loss is neglected with ring resonator testing and back calculating the dissipation factor, uh, you can get a, an erroneous uh, type of result for the dissipation factor. Another issue is spurious modes when you get to very high frequency. And finally, there are conductor losses to consider. And at lower microwave frequencies, there's uh, formulas and there's calculations to consider these pretty accurately. Once you get to the higher millimeter wave frequencies, uh, this is much more problematic. And again, uh, conductor losses and radiation losses have to be well understood to back calculate the dissipation factor for the material being tested with the ring resonator. In the picture shown here, I uh, show a ring resonator and it's a typical ring resonator designed with gap coupling. However, what's different is the feed lines. The feed lines are not a microstrip feed line. These are grounded coplanar feed lines and the benefit there is when designed correctly, you get no radiation along the feed lines plus the feed lines will not resonate and cause their own resonant peak to disturb the one you want to measure. And then also you can uh, design this to where you will have no spurious modes that would interfere with, again, the mode you want to measure. So this turns out to be a pretty good way of measuring uh, high frequency uh, resonant peaks. The next picture I show here is a screenshot of one of these ring resonators and it's resonating right about 78 gigahertz. So this is pretty high frequency. And you can see by the screenshot, and this is from a network analyzer, you can see from the screenshot that the resonator is pretty well behaved and, and pretty well balanced. Aside from ring resonators, uh, another method to use is transmission line testing. Now transmission lines are used in uh, pretty much any kind of microwave or millimeter wave board because that's what connects the different components together. So testing transmission lines seems to be a pretty smart thing to do. And we've developed a test method that's really based on the differential length test method of microstrip transmission lines. And this topic, if you want more details, has already been discussed on another Coonrod's Corner that is titled Common Test Methods for Measuring Dielectric Constant. So now let's look at some measured data. And the first one I'm going to look at is using the 5 mil 3003 RO3003 laminates and looking at microstrip transmission line testing from about 10 megahertz to 110 gigahertz. 
As you can see in this chart, there is a comparison of uh, two different materials being tested. These are, again, microstrip transmission lines, and they are using the 5 mil RO3003 material. However, they're using different copper. The blue curve is actually using the standard ED copper, and the gray curve is using a rolled copper. The rolled copper has a much smoother surface, and because of that, you get much less uh, conductor loss, which means less insertion loss. And you can see, overall, the rolled copper uh, has much lower insertion loss than the standard ED copper. Another graph to consider is, uh, again, from about 10 megahertz to 110 gigahertz, and this is using a different type of material, and this is using the RO4350B Low Pro Laminate. This particular laminate is a thermal set material, so it is not a PTFE-based material such as the RO3003 that we just discussed. This is a hydrocarbon thermal set laminate, and uh, you can see that it has very good performance all the way out to 110 gigahertz. This is a little bit thicker than the last slide that I showed that was a 5 mil laminate. This is a 7.3 mil thick laminate, and because of that, there are some things in design that need to be considered. However, you can see that the response out to 110 gigahertz is very well behaved. And also, if you look at the losses around 80 gigahertz compared to this chart and the previous one, they're just about the same for insertion loss around 79 or 80 gigahertz. And that's really because even though this laminate has a little higher dissipation factor than the RL3003, the thickness and the difference in thickness and the conductor width to account for that for 50 ohm transmission lines also makes a difference. So you end up with just about the same amount of insertion loss as you would on the 5 mil RO3003 laminate. Now an item to consider that is a little bit of a word of caution, and that is when Rogers offers insertion loss curves, we do that with uh, microstrip transmission lines that are using bare copper. And the reason we do that instead of other plating finishes that can be used is because it's a more generic way of uh, analyzing the substrate as well as it's a little bit easier for putting into electromagnetic modeling software. So when we give insertion loss, we give insertion loss on microstrip transmission lines with bare copper, and the data when matched with a electromagnetic modeling software is a lot easier. In the software, you don't have to worry about the different uh, plating types or the plating thicknesses, and it's a lot easier. As shown in the chart here, this is microstrip insertion loss testing on 5 mil RT Duroid 6002 laminate with uh, rolled copper, which actually has a very similar performance to the 5 mil RO3003 laminate with rolled copper. But really what I'm showing here is the difference between the bare copper curve and the circuits with ENIG. ENIG is uh, abbreviation for electrus nickel immersion gold, and it does cause more conductor loss and ultimately more insertion loss. So you can see the values we normally report with bare copper are better than with ENIG. However, if that plating finish was silver, then they would be very similar to the bare copper curve. So that's the reason we normally do not show different plating finishes on our material because we really can't cover all the bases, and it's just easier to show insertion loss curves with bare copper. This concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you are not already a member, join the Rogers Technology Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more of Coonrod's Corner and other informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Rog mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.